Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overall series in Kerbal Space Program 1.0.4. In this episode you see here that on alarm clock I've got queued up a Venus transfer, a Jupiter transfer, and a Mars transfer. So we're getting a little bit more ambitious, but let's check out our contracts to see what we actually have contracts for. So right now we have zero active contracts, nothing here. Uh, we have this contract for Science Day from Space Around Earth, which should be pretty easy. Science Day from Space Around Mars, a little bit harder, but they give us seven years for it, which is plenty of time. Uh, and we're going to be sending a probe over. Uh, Science Day from Space Around the Moon, uh, it's practically not worth it at that uh, rate, actually. And uh, it's not like we need any more reputation, we're pretty high up there already. So yeah, that, they're not giving us enough for that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Crude lunar flyby is something I want to do and I already have a rocket. Uh, I, I have a potential rocket, but it's a little bit tight on the margins. Uh, but that is very lucrative, so we have to look at that. But take a look at the reputation hit there. And obviously they have a, quite a failure rate. Demos flyby, if we send the probe over to Mars, maybe we should uh, aim to do a combo sort of thing and fly by either Deimos or Phobos. But on that, we don't have too much margin. We've got a two-year duration on that. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is Venus flyby. So let me just pick up this contract. And, um, yeah, we just have to transmit some data from it. So that should be straightforward. And they do give us a uh, Jupiter flyby contract. But uh, that's in five years. Uh, hopefully it'll uh, hang out. It doesn't. It expires in five days. It says, but uh, I certainly hope we get another one. And a Saturn flyby is a different thing altogether. The problem with five years is the transit time to Jupiter is quite long, and uh, so yeah, that's a, that's a question mark right there. But uh, as far as specific orbit around Deimos, and we can forget Mercury, uncrewed Deimos landing, so this is way off still. Um, uh, uncrewed Mars landing is a little bit more possible because you can use parachutes. And um, yeah, you don't actually need too much thrust to land on Mars once you get there. And we've gotten something there already. So all we have to do is make sure it has a heat shield and then uh, it'll go through the atmosphere and have a little parachute. So, yeah, that's that's potentially doable. We'll have to look into that. But let me uh, talk about the Venus Venus probe first. And I'm going to pick up the science data from space around Mars because that's going to be something we can launch easily enough. And um, I'll pass on these two for now. Okay, so let's take a look at the situation in the VAB. In my previous Realism Overhaul series, I named the probes after characters in Terry Pratchett novels. This time, I think I'm gonna use Lord of the Rings. Uh, some of the names might be difficult for me to pronounce as a result, but uh, we're going for Bilbo first, so that's straightforward enough. Uh, so Bilbo on the Astrid 2. Now, l well, let's start from the top, and I'll talk about why uh, the Astrid has been upgraded. upgraded. Okay, but this is the Bilbo probe. It's a very small probe with just uh, the smallest scientific instruments and then the big antenna and of course solar panels and more solar panels and then this is the ABLE avionics package and here we have its own transfer stage. Uh, the probe itself has fuel that isn't being read by this and uh, to the, uh, the utilization of that tank is only 50% but that's because I needed the ports separated enough and we've got a little antennae. Um, it's probably got about 600 meters per second, I'd say. And then uh, the probe actually ends here. There's a decoupler here, uh, right underneath, tucked in between the solar panels. And then this is a transfer stage that has 1,996, and it has seven one kilonewton thrusters burning hydrazine. And these are hydrazine configured RCS. Okay, and so that's basically the idea up there. And this probe core can handle 5 tons, this one can handle 0.2. You can see that the upper probe is sized to 0.195 because of the capacity of uh, the probe core right there. But that probe core can go into low power mode, so that's important. 
and here the trans this transfer stage has 2,205. It is an RD58, and that's interesting because of course we have another RD58 here, but it was by far the best engine to choose. So we do have an RD58 there, and that uh, remember that this probe core has a capacity of five tons, and we had 0.2 there. And so this whole portion, including this, has a mass of 5.147. In other words, I basically add this stage in order to use up the, the capacity of this ABLE avionics package. And that seemed to be the optimal way to go, even though it costs a little bit more because I'm doubling up the, these engines. I mean, it seems weird to have two of the same engines. However, we are dumping this core and, and other stuff as well. So it was marginally better to stage it like this rather than have a larger stage, let's say an 8 minute stage here. So that was the idea. And yeah, I don't think I have too much more to say about that. So heading on down, this is a 5 minute stage now. And continuing. This is why the Astrid, this is an Astrid 2. Somebody pointed out, I forget who it was, who pointed out that this, uh, the reason why the RD0124 unlocks now in the tech tree instead of later, because the 0124 is a much more advanced engine, is because it has a configuration for the RD0107-108. Now, you might remember that we have been using this engine, this is an RD0105 that was used on Luna and Vostok, the R7 upper stages. And this, this RD0107 was used in Molnia, which was sort of the upgrade to the Vostok, if you will, for, um, for probe launches, for interplanetary probe launches. Ammonia had sort of a sketchy history, uh, sometimes worked, sometimes didn't for the interplanetary probes. It, I mean, it was early times after all. Um, however, this is a very good engine. If we take a look at this configuration here, it has a vacuum ISP of 326, and since we don't have Hydrolox engines yet, that's the best we can do. Incidentally, the 0110 isn't a big upgrade, so not a big deal there. So we're going to keep it like this. And yeah, so Astrid 2 because of that change. Now, whether it's really a great improvement over the LR105 is debatable. And the reason being, uh, the masses are close to about the same. And yes, this has 326 vacuum ISP, this is 309. But this has higher thrust. And so you can see here, at this stage, we have a thrust weight ratio of 0.82. Uh, this one actually uh, boosts, a little, boosts, boosts it a little bit better and that might help our trajectory a bit and stuff like that and allow us to carry more fuel as well. So it's sort of a toss up between the ISP and the fact that uh, we have better thrust there. Okay, so anyway, but uh, it's still under my usual 12 minute limit uh, altogether. We're planning to get into orbit within 12 minutes. Um, these burn 11 minutes and 15 seconds, and we might have to burn a little bit of that stage in order to complete orbit. We'll see. Uh, the bottom is still the same for the Astrid. In other words, we have four of these LRA9 boosters, and despite unlocking new technologies, we have not enabled the, the upgrades for this. Not even the Dash 6 version. Sort of sad, really. Considering uh, we seem to be like, I mean, as far as our high thrust engines, we seem to be lagging behind in ISP. Um, we do have, I mean, the problem with uh, the R7 core engine and booster is, of course, the the thrust is not enough, uh, and they're big, so can't fit uh, four of them as easily on here as I would like. Of course, we could use side boosters, but uh, I'll get to that now. This this whole setup costs uh, a little bit under thirteen thousand funds, and uh, we end up with about thirteen thousand one hundred meters per second once I've got all the fairings on. That's pretty good considering the previous Mars probe that we did with about uh, well the delta V on that Mars probe on the Colossus was 
13,959 meters per second with all the fairings on and it came in at a mass of 405 tons. This one is going to be about 195 tons and that had a cost of 20,326 so this is a huge savings. The problem is it does have 800 meters per second less. Now and uh, in neither case am I counting the Delta V in the probe itself. So not that hydrazine, that's not being counted. And that's true of the other probe. So yeah, it is a little bit short on Delta V. And so I decided to make a version with SRBs. Here we go, this is the Bilbo on the Astrid 2-4. The probe is exactly the same. All the stages are uh, the same up till the bottom stage. The bottom stage is different. It is now extended by 25 seconds and we have slapped four SRBs on. And these SRBs have a vacuum ISP of 235 and 215 C level. They burn for 70 seconds, a minute and 10 seconds. And they have a thrust of, uh, let's say, 354 kilonewtons vacuum. Now, with this little uh, booster package, if you will, uh, we have increased our mass by 80 tons we have increased our cost by 3,000 tons, uh, 3,000 funds, sorry, tons, funds, uh, 3,000 funds, and we've added about 600 meters per second of delta V. And this is why I haven't been using SRBs, because they actually cost quite a lot. I mean, when you think about uh, an additional 3,000 uh, funds, and some of that is the extension of this tank, so we have to be fair about that. But um, yeah, it's basically like 600 each. Uh, let me, I guess I'll take them off and then see, and I'll reload it later. Let's take them off. Okay, well, no, that's about, uh, it's almost, it's almost uh, 3,000 funds, so yeah, about 700 funds each. I think the decoupler is pretty expensive too. Let me check out the uh, decoupler. Oh well, no, it's only 20, so really it's just the SRB that's really expensive. Yeah, so 700 each, which is, you know, as much as any of these really fancy engines. And these are 800, these little engines down here are 800. Of course, they don't come with the fuel. You have to add the fuel. But, uh, yeah. So that's why I haven't been using SRBs very much, but this seemed to be the time to do it. And, uh, yeah. The net result is 600 meters per second extra. We will build the one without SRBs first, attempt to launch it to Venus. If it works, then this one with the SRBs will be sent to Mars. If it doesn't work, then uh, this one obviously will be sent to Venus in, in its place. And hopefully this one will get there. And we have some redundancy. Remember, we can relight the RD-58s, and we have two of those. So, because we have like uh, five ignitions on each of those, that gives us some ability to uh, shut down if we mess up and then uh, reorient and do it properly. So, hopefully, we won't have to do that, but we have that option. Okay. Anyway, let me load up the the one without the boosters. Cue that in our build queue, and then also cue this one afterwards. Taking a look at our tech tree, there are two things that are really hampering us right now. The fact that we don't have Hydrolox engines, um, and those are here. We'll need 60 science to unlock those, but we can't do it yet. We haven't unlocked Mature Orbital Rocketry, which we are currently researching. Uh, so we are looking for Hydrolox engines, and that'll be good. Uh, the other thing is our RCS and our 1 kN thrusters are very inefficient. They only give us 198 ISP and they only run on hydrazine. What we would like is thrusters that run on monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. And I guess that's going to be unlocked with this flight control mature three axis control for uncrewed and crewed spacecraft. And it seems that there are RCS quads here. Hopefully this means, I mean it doesn't say that I'm unlocking the better fuels but I'm hoping that that's going to be the case. So that's a 40 science thing. We only have 20 science right now. So those are my goals with, uh, with the science that we get from this Venus trip, hopefully. Well, we're nowhere near the Venus transfer point yet, so let's just finish building the first one. I think 
maybe I should uh, try and build the rocket for the lunar flyby mission. I'm not entirely confident that we have. I would like a Hydrolox engine for that, but maybe I can. Maybe I can try something. Okay, we're about to complete the Bilbo on the asteroid too, but uh, we're not at our target transfer point yet. Guess we could throw this Mars probe 1A at, at it if we really wanted to. We don't even need to do this Bilbo thing, but the Bilbo one is cheaper. Yeah, I mean uh, this one has a lot more Delta V, it's more expensive, we could repurpose it to something a little bit more substantial. Uh, maybe I could, well, replacing the engines would probably cost a lot. We'll see. That's another backup, and we sure have a lot of those. Okay, let me go into the VAB and look at what kind of uh, lunar flyby mission we could put together. Okay, well, this is a tough one. This is going to be tough. This is a very tight margined launch if we decide to do it. Asteroid 3. And above all else, it's also pretty risky. Uh, so we'll want to test it unmanned. The problem with that is that instead of a probe core here, where I had the probe core on the launch with Jeb, I've got the, the life support tank, food, water, and oxygen. And we have enough food, water, and oxygen there for, well, um, more than 14 days, except for the water is only 13 days. I was aiming for 14 days, but for some reason it's sort of weirdly balanced like that. So, yeah, uh, for some reason we've got way more oxygen. I don't know why why it's sized so that there's so much more oxygen. But anyway, something wrong with the procedural life support tanks, clearly. But otherwise, we still have the hydrazine up there. Uh, I flipped the decoupler around. Hopefully that's right. Um, otherwise, I, I don't mind the idea of having the decoupler around just to shield this stuff in case. But we have a somewhat different I mean it's a slightly larger service module here and uh, but otherwise the five one kilonewton thrusters as before s larger solar panels there's the Agena core as we had before and then this upper stage is the RD58 uh, so that's normal uh, but this is a now a lunar transfer engine and it's got nine minute burn time uh, not only lunar transfer, it's also got the completing orbit part, if necessary. It does have those five ignitions. So, yeah, that's the plan there. And we do have enough avionics for all of that. Uh, well, actually, there is a complication. If we do this unmanned, uncrewed... Hmm. Oh, well, if we uh, take off the, the escape tower, let's say just that much. Okay, uh, then the Agena core carries 16 tons so the Gina core can carry all of this the problem is then we can't separate this portion this portion has no controller on it if it's uncrewed so that's uh, that's a complication if we want to test this out um, and that probably means we wouldn't be able to complete a lunar transfer on the test so I don't know what kind of test that is we might have to just launch this crude on the first try now the next stage is one of these guys. Actually this should be placed like that, but I guess it doesn't make a, too much of a difference. Anyway, uh, again it's uh, configured as an RD0107-8, uh, but we are burning it for 8 minutes now, and it's going to do most of the job of getting us to orbit. And then we have this configuration with the four LR-89s there and then on the boosters we have LR-79s uh, configured in LR-79 NA-9 mode which has a little bit more sea level and vacuum ISP. I have decided to try putting parachutes on these. I don't know if that's going to work out at all or not. That is up to stage recovery to decide whether those come back safely or not but we'll try it out anyway. So yeah, this is the situation now. Uh, you might be wondering, obviously it's a little bit dicey to try and bring this back um, through the through the atmosphere. The, the re-entry is going to be quite harsh and we seem to have a lot of overheating signals just on getting back down from orbit. So the idea is that we're going to be 
going high in the atmosphere to bleed off speed, we're probably going to make multiple orbits to burn off the excess speed. And then only after doing that, only after getting into a lower orbit, do we finally bring it down. Uh, so that is the plan. And that's going to require that hydrazine up there to uh, help us maneuver and make sure that we don't have an incorrect periapsis. So yeah, multiple orbits. That's also why we needed the 14 days worth of food, water, and oxygen. It only takes like three days to get to the moon and three days back or something like that. Um, even if you get into orbit around the moon, you could do the round trip in under eight days. So the extra food, water, and oxygen is so that we can bleed off speed carefully and bring the orbit down. Otherwise, this this would be tough. Uh, altogether, it doesn't have much by way of margins. Uh, it is a flyby mission. It wouldn't have enough to get into orbit around the moon. So yeah, uh, let me load it up again, and I guess we'll start building it, and we'll see how that goes. I mean, funds is not a big deal. We have the funds. I you could argue that I should just slap more boosters on, but. So I want to try that. Oh, uh, one thing I need to do is put some separation rockets on these. These are pretty heavy. So we need some separatrons on those to make sure that they separate okay. I'll do that and then queue it up for building. Okay, I think it's high time we time warped to the Venus transfer time and see how that works out for us. As far as the Jupiter transfer time, I don't see that one working out for us. So I'm going to cancel that. We should be able to get another launch off to Mars, though. Even if it's just another Mars Probe 1A and we try and hit Deimos or Phobos. Okay, I have time warped to a minimal inclination to the Moon. That's not necessarily minimal to Venus. And in fact, uh, even though alarm clock says there's a transfer time, transfer window to Venus, we might not be in an optimal location depending on the inclination situation. Taking a look, uh, let's target Venus and see. Mm, well, we can't tell right now, it doesn't show it. Okay, well, we'll have to try it out. So here we go. Okay, SAS on, throttle is up. Well, almost up, there we go. All of the fuel seems to be loaded properly. Very well, ignition and launch. Okay, it doesn't show local controls, that's good, that's actually how it's supposed to be. So we have a signal delay, oh yay. And I'm gonna hand it off to Smart ASS. Okay, we are at 2 G's of acceleration, 6 kilometers altitude, and we have broken the sound barrier. Okay, somewhere around here we will be at maximum dynamic pressure. I could check far or probably a mechjet reading, but I think this is about where it is. The lag is substantial mainly because I uh, was popping into the VAB so much and loaded so many craft without restarting the game. I really should have restarted the game before launching this. That's why we seem to have quite a lot more lag than I'm used to, I think. Now, strictly speaking, we don't need to turn off two of the engines to reduce the G-load since we're, we don't have Kerbals on board or anything. So I'm wondering whether I should do that or not. So here we are passing four Gs, and I think I'm just going to keep all four engines going. Probably the most efficient thing to do to just punch through this part of the atmosphere as quickly as possible. Not very thick part of the atmosphere, obviously, but still some drag. Doesn't read it here though. I should probably just get rid of the atmospheric drag thing here since it doesn't read it anymore. It doesn't read current acceleration either. Strange. Okay, separation. Okay, and ignition of our new engine. Okay, RD0107 seems to be ignited. Not much of a plume on them, but alright. Um, I think we'll be separating the fairings during this stage. 
And in fact, I think it's prudent to th dump them right now. Let's go for it. Okay, they seem well clear of the vessel. Let's get our supplementary antennae out. Okay, just for you to know, I've locked the upper stage hydrazine tanks, so that stage right there is not showing up in our total delta V. We have a little bit more delta V than it's showing right there. Not a whole lot more, mind you, but still. Just to avoid confusion. And we're just halfway through this burn right now. I'd say right now it looks like this rocket without the additional boosters can get to Venus. But we haven't plotted a Venus transfer yet, so... And in fact, uh, looking at... I didn't do a Venus probe in my .90 realism overhaul series, it looks like. After wrapping that one up, I didn't see any science around Venus done, which is weird. And my most v recent Venus probe in my Soul System colonization series failed. So, yeah, I guess it's uh, something I don't know too much about just yet. Better be cautious. Okay, 15 more seconds. Our apoapsis is going to end up a bit high. I'll try to keep our periapsis low. Separation. And ignition of the RD-58. Alright. Got 2,000 more meters per second here, which means we will have to use the next stage for a little bit in order to actually get to orbit. So we are going to have to plan for that. A little bit of extra pitch might be a good idea. Gotta tune the main dish to Earth. Sort of important. Let's not have a repeat of the problem I had in the Soul System colonization series, where it apparently wasn't tuned to Earth. Uh, SAS disengaged. Why is SAS disengaged? What? Why? Why does it say SAS disengaged? I mean, of course, Smart ASS is in control, but. What 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 happened there exactly? Flight computer, did you do something? I don't know. That's very weird. So we'll need about uh, 400 meters per second for the next stage. Okay, 15 more seconds. We are past apoapsis though, just barely, and we are... Well, we're getting back to it anyway. We probably didn't need this hydrazine in this tank. That was unnecessary. We could have saved on that mass. But anyway, we're getting ready for separation here. I'm not going to try and use that up. It would take too long. Okay, switching back to SAS. Just short of orbit right now. It's tempting to turn on RCS and C. Let's see. Eh, no, it's not going to do anything. Okay, separation. And ignition. Okay, so 318 by 212, well, really 319 by 213 if you'd like. Okay, solar panels out. Well, at least this set. Let's verify that that gets us enough charge. Yes, it does. Very good. And of course, since we are only going closer to the sun on our trip to Venus, that's excellent. And now, let me just see our delta V situation. Oh, wait, it's okay. It was auto saving. Um, by unlocking this, well, and then unlocking this as well. Okay, so 3,950, oops, 56, 55, 54, what? Um, 53, what? We're not losing a whole bunch of stuff, are we? Uh, what, what? Hold on, let me lock the hydrazine tanks before anything else happens. What's up with this? We're not, it's not boiling off. 
Hmm. I think uh, oh, it's just this engine gimbal. It's because here, there we go. All better now. All right, so we have close to about four thousand meters per second to work with. Let's see if we can make a transfer to Venus for that. Okay, there we go. Uh, potential Venus periapsis of three hundred and eighty-six kilometers. If we do this. 3,534 meter per second burn. It's very touchy, of course, to the second, and uh, I'm not going to do it that precisely. We have, um, well, a minute and 51 seconds on this stage to burn, and then a uh, much more substantial burn in the next stage. We should probably try and finish up this stage before the maneuver node, and then the rest of the burn after the maneuver node would probably be ideal. Anyway, um, in retrospect, I should have named the probe Frodo instead of Bilbo, because if ever there was a planet that most resembled Mordor, uh, yeah, this would be it. Okay, so uh, 11 minutes until the burn, and let's set up for it. Now, I'll make sure that all the stuff up here is locked. Okay, this has hydrazine as well. Ironically, this has less hydrazine than the other stage, even though we really didn't need the hydrazine in that stage. Okay, let's see about the fuel situation. Very stable. Okay, ignition. Now, Smarty SS can hold the node because of the gimbling of the engine. Now, uh, taking a look at when do we arrive at Venus, if this all works all right. 163 days. So we have to do other stuff before actually arriving. Well, no, we don't strictly. We should do other stuff before arriving. That's 232 days where uh, until the Mars transfer, though, so we don't really need to do that just yet. We could take the mission into Venus before even thinking about that Mars transfer. But yeah, I, I think we don't want to waste those t uh, those 160 days or so. So we will complete the transfer here and then uh, pick up the story of this probe in a future episode. Okay, I'm unlocking the hydrazine up here. Not in the probe itself yet though. Okay, set, and ignition. Okay, well this stage definitely has enough and then we still have about let's say 600 meters per second in the probe itself, though that's not being read because it's all RCS. Okay, we're approaching escape velocity here. We are past the orbit of the moon. Taking a look, there we go. There, There's a node around there. That's why it's not an exact Hohmann transfer. Uh, so we're not trying to hit it there. Because uh, we'd still have some inclination issue there. Okay, well I'll just do the plan maneuver for now. And then correct with RCS. Okay, we seem to be a little bit close. Let's see. Okay, that looks like a minimum like that. Still trying to use RCS to minimize this. Okay, I think I've got a RCS rhythm here. I'm holding down the J key, which is doing this, and then every so often I have to press N to do that. That seems to be getting our orbit closer and closer. We'll see whether there's a limit. Again, uh, 20,000 kilometers is the goal. Venus flyby right there. I wonder why it says check altitude below 20,000. Well, it's not around Venus. It's uh, currently around Earth. Mm, well, anyway, it's got a different condition for which location it's actually around. Okay, looks like uh, we'll not only get to 20,000 kilometers, but I can probably bring it down to the close past I originally plotted, which would be good. And we still have fuel in this stage, which is even better. Okay. That looks good. Let me take RCS off so it doesn't mess with that. That's pretty good. 
We'll try and again to orbit around Venus. Uh, let's quickly take a look. We I, obviously not by arrow breaking. That would be suicide. But using a manual burn, uh, it'll be tough. Assuming I've got 600 in the probe itself and 200 here. I don't think I have. I mean, it'll be very close. Depends how close to 600 I really have. But potentially, I mean, maybe a gentle little bit of arrow breaking? I don't know. Anyway, a bit dodgy. But, yeah, we can... Let's let's bring it out into, uh, into interplanetary space. We don't want it still hanging around Earth SOI. And it looks like this will work. It's got plenty of electric charge generation right now. I didn't even orient it to the sun. It seems highly variable, oddly enough. Don't know what that's about. But uh, I'll take it. And we'll just check that communication is... Oh, okay, that's weird. See, why is the electric charge generation all over the... No? Okay, that's why. Persistent rotation. Hmm... It's not rotating that fast, actually. I'm just gonna put SAS on. Oh, uh, Smart ASS off and SAS on. Just to kill the persistent rotation thing, otherwise our electric charge is gonna be all over the place, and that, as I time warp very quickly, that might cause worrying issues. I mean, should I use, I mean, it'll take a trivial amount of RCS to, well, I mean, it, it should be stable anyway. Okay. Yep, should not be a controversial issue. Well, now electric charge is zero. So, it's not just persistent rotation that's causing a curious issue. Okay, we are in interplanetary space. We are still communicating with Earth. Occasionally it drops to zero electric char charge generation. And our periapsis on the Venus side is 243 kilometers. So, pretty much where we had it before SOI change. But this is continually dropping off and on. We are not rotating. Only half of our panels are really facing the sun properly. I'm gonna get the other set of panels out. Looks looks all right to me. So let's add the alarm for SOI change at Venus, and this is all set. Okay, so we didn't need the backup, backup uh, Astrid 2 4, the one with four boosters, as it turns out. So we have a choice of things to do next time. Uh, I've added back in the Jupiter transfer because we've got some Colossuses sitting around, as well as that extra probe there. I'll probably save that one for Mars. But we've got some long range probes that could do stuff. Maybe this Lunesat can be edited and we can see if we can toss it over to Jupiter if we do it in good time. So that's a thing to contemplate. Otherwise, uh, maybe we will handle the crewed mission, lunar flyby mission, and before doing the Mars mission. I'll have to decide what I have the guts for. Alright, but uh, we, we have launched a probe to Venus and we will see how that turns out later on and on that note I'll say thank you for watching if you enjoyed this episode please do press like if you have any comments or suggestions please leave them in the comment section below and I'll see you next time